Um, I had a person call who it was a was employed for many years, lost her job. She's not 65. She be, she went on Minnesota Care. Then she became a contractor, lost her Minnesota Care. She has a serious blood disease, so she'll never pass the pre-existing. She absolutely has no income now because she lost her job. She was a contractor. There's no unemployment. So this person became very angry um, because she couldn't get health care. And the lesson that needs to be learned is that this is a problem for society that this happens to people in that age group before Medicare. And I don't think people are recognizing that. They're thinking that um, everybody's working, everybody has an employer plan, the, the, the poverty folks are all taken care of. That's not the case. Tomorrow you could be diagnosed with something and you're 55 and you lose your job. And you, you really have a problem. Healthcare for retirees is also under attack. Employers are no longer helping fund retiree health care, even bridges to Medicare. Elected officials and experts tell us that Medicare costs too much. They tell us that seniors do not have enough skin in the game. And they tell us we should turn Medicare over to the insurance companies. What is true is that healthcare for senior Americans costs more than for younger people because older people use more healthcare than younger people. Medicare reports that adults between ages 55 and 64 use twice as much care as younger adults aged 19 to 44. Seniors between ages 65 and 74 use three times as much as those younger adults. Seniors between ages 75 and 84 use five times as much as those younger adults. And seniors aged 85 and older use eight times as much as those younger adults. Until retirees are eligible for Medicare, they are on their own to pay for this health care. A recent comprehensive survey of employers reported that only 26% of large companies and 6% of small companies even offer retiree health care. Pre-65 health insurance is expensive. Here are two examples. A retired Minnesota state employee can stay on the active employee health plan at a cost of $447 per month for single coverage and $1,315 per month for family coverage. The standard Blue Cross plan for our non-smoker, age 60 to 64, with a $1,000 deductible is $590 per month in the metro area and $656 per month in greater Minnesota. Smokers and people with unspecified other health factors are charged 30% more. This means that early retirement is often not possible for people without an employer-paid bridge to Medicare. One of the major accomplishments of the Affordable Care Act is to make early retirement feasible again. Starting in 2014, the Affordable Care Act will make premium and out-of-pocket subsidies available to anyone without employer-paid coverage, including pre-65 retirees. The subsidies will depend upon income. Here are two examples of the premium subsidy. A two-person family making $29,400 per year would have their share of the family premium capped at $154 a month. A two-person family making $44,000 per year would have their share of the family premium capped at $349 per month. Once you reach age 65 and are Medicare eligible, things do get better. You are eligible for Medicare at age 65 regardless of when you are eligible for Social Security. Medicare consists of Part A, Part B, and Part D. In addition, you may need to purchase a Medicare supplement to cover out-of-pocket costs not covered by Medicare itself. Medicare Part A covers inpatient hospital, home health, limited skilled nursing, and hospice care. It is funded by a payroll tax of 2.9% on all wages split equally between the employee and the employer. The Medicare Part A trust fund had $325 billion in reserves at the end of 2011. Starting in 2013, the Affordable Care Act requires that higher income workers pay an additional 0.9% tax on earnings over $200,000 per year on an individual tax return and over $250,000 per year on a joint tax return. Part A does require out-of-pocket spending by the Medicare recipient. The most significant is a hospital deductible of $1,156 per spell of illness.
In addition, there is cost sharing for extended hospital stays and extended stays in a skilled nursing facility. In 2011, Medicare Part A paid out an average of $5,200 in benefits for each enrollee. Medicare Part A already has higher expenditures and income and must draw down assets from the trust fund. Medicare estimates that in 2024, assets in the trust fund will have been exhausted. It would require a payroll tax increase of less than 1% or a benefit cut of almost 20% to balance the books. Medicare Part B covers physician services, outpatient hospital services, durable medical equipment, lab test, ambulance, and end-stage renal disease. By law, enrollees must pay one quarter of the cost of the plan. The rest is paid by the federal government out of general revenue, not the payroll tax. For 2012, the Medicare B premium is $99.90 per month. Higher premiums are charged for those making $85,000 a year or more. The Part B premium is automatically deducted from the Social Security check. In addition, there is a cost sharing with Part B. There is $140 per year deductible, followed by 20% cost sharing on most services after the deductible is met. In 2011, Medicare Part B paid out an average of $4,900 for each enrollee. The Affordable Care Act has made two major changes to the Part B benefit. Both of these are already in effect. First, it adds an annual wellness visit as a covered service. Second, it makes preventive care and screening services available without paying the Part B deductible and coinsurance. This newest part of Medicare is the prescription drug benefit, Medicare Part D. Part D was added in 2006. It is a very complex benefit design, including the so-called donut hole, where it will not provide any coverage. Because Medicare Part D is sold only through health plans, the premium amount you pay depends on the plan you pick. In 2011, Medicare D paid out an average of $1,900 for each enrollee. The Medicare share of the cost is paid out of the general revenue, not the payroll tax. Enrollees with incomes over $85,000 per year pay additional Part D premiums. Unless modified by the particular Part D plan you purchase, Part D requires an annual deductible of $320. After the deductible, it pays three quarters of the next $2,600 in costs. You pay one quarter. You then hit the so-called donut hole, where Part D pays nothing on the next $3,700 in costs. You pay all of these costs. Once you have incurred $6,700 in total prescription drug costs, Part D kicks in again and pays 95% of the remaining cost, while you pay 5%. The biggest impact of the Affordable Care Act is to close the donut hole over the next eight years. The law requires drug companies to give a 50% discount on brand name drugs during the coverage gap. Starting in 2013, Part D will pick up an increasing amount of the cost of brand name drugs each year until it covers three quarters of the cost in 2020. Also starting in 2013, Part D will pick up an increasing amount of the cost of generic drugs until it covers three quarters of those costs by 2020. You will then pay one quarter of the cost of drugs during the donut hole. This Medicare cost sharing adds up. Medicare reports that enrollees pay an average of $1,800 a year in out-of-pocket costs on top of the Medicare B and D premiums. Those who are sicker than normal pay an average of $2,700 out-of-pocket on top of those premiums. This explains the need for Medicare supplement plans. Comprehensive Medicare supplements with full coverage of the donut hole run from $230 to $300 per month, depending on the plan you pick. Less expensive coverage can be found for many health plans, but only by agreeing to higher co-pays, no coverage for the donut hole, limited provider networks, or a limited list of covered prescriptions. So where does this leave us going forward? The Affordable Care Act is a beginning, but only a beginning of a commitment that all Americans are entitled to affordable health care. The hard issue is aging of the baby boomers and the increased health care costs this will entail. There are only three options. Increase enrollee costs through higher premiums and out-of-pocket charges. Reduce costs of care through more efficient care delivery and lower payments to health plans and providers. Or increase the payroll tax and general fund revenue going to Medicare. In other words, raise taxes. The issue for us is how to influence that decision in a way that best protects current and future retirees.